Hello, my kako. Uh, my name is Tyler Yukapakomis. I'm the Chief Administrator for Kilohana, and we're here today with... Aloha. I'm uh, Rick Barboza from Hui Ku Maliola, and uh, one of the co-founders of Papahana Kuola, and specialize in native plants. Not just specialize, you might be one of the most knowledgeable people. No, 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 no. Okay, well, There's and he's humble too. Many people. But uh, we're out here today at Aya Loop Trail, and we are talking about the importance of recognizing native and non-native plants. Talk to us a little bit about, why don't we say invasives? Sure. Um, you know, when we talk about invasive species, we're primarily talking about plants that are, you know, on their own, spreading rapidly, taking over uh, areas that were once occupied by native species and are a problem to manage and control. And, uh, you know, over the last 100, 150 years, we've, we've kind of managed to bring in the worst of the worst, you know, shrubs, trees, uh, and bring them in here, uh, mainly for reasons that supported an industry that doesn't exist anymore, which is, you know, sugarcane and pineapple, mm -hmm. uh, to kind of help uh, support the watershed, which is what they were thinking back in the day, but it's now proven to be wrong. And now, uh, we've kind of squeezed out, if we haven't physically removed our native plants by development, now silently these trees and shrubs are further pushing them out. And, uh, and the more that they continue to do that, you know, the less uh, we have to retain of our, of our natural history and our culture. So, yeah. uh, and here at Aya Loop Trail, uh, this is just a small example of how it's like everywhere, uh, every island. So, you know, you're the specialist, so as we were doing the hike this morning, you're able to point out dozens of invasive species. Yep. For people like me, who maybe aren't as well-versed, what can we do, or how can we become more informed, and how do we address these problems? Yeah, I, I think uh, the main thing to do is to just go out and see them, you know? Um, for your own benefit, you know, it's also healthy to get out and hike and, and see things, but uh, try not to get you know, greenwashed by all of the foliage and stuff that you see and the lushness of places because chances are, you know, especially if you're in lower valleys, you're just surrounded by non-native species. Yeah. Uh, so at that point, you know, it'd be good to kind of, I would read up first. There's a lot of books that show, you know, pictures and examples of which plants are native and which ones are invasive. And, um, you know, being invasive by nature, these plants will usually form big stands of nothing but themselves. Mm -hmm. So when you get into an area, like for example, over here, you know, the whole way up to this point, we were surrounded by strawberry guava. Uh, and strawberry guava is one of the absolute worst trees that were ever to be introduced into Hawaii. So easy to recognize and see. We all grew up knowing what strawberry guava is. We may not have known that it's not native and yeah. super invasive, but it is. Um, but other plants within this area, you know, there's also a, a ton of eucalyptus that was not in, uh, native to Hawaii. There's uh, inkberry, there's clydemia. All these plants, you know, play their part in suppressing Hawaiian plants. Yeah. So, yeah. Should we be removing them? What, or is it better to leave it to experts like you? Um, you know, on your own property, sure. Remove them as much as you can. Or at least manage them, you know. I mean, we like strawberry guava to eat. Uh, just make sure you eat them and, uh, before the birds get them. Uh, and then, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with that if, if you're actively managing it. Uh, in the wild, you know, it's really difficult to do. Um, and you want to have a plan in place to make sure that once you remove that vegetation, that you're not going to create a bigger problem with erosion. So you want to have, you know, certain things in place that that will minimize that threat of erosion once you remove yeah. the invasive species and then quickly, you know, have plants available that are from that area, ideally from that gene pool, you know, of native species to replant. Another huge problem, even though we have vast areas of invasive species covering, you know, valleys and, and ridge lines, uh, certain ones do the opposite of, of trying to retain water and, and water retention for our watersheds. Uh, for example, our strawberry guavas and even our eucalyptus. Uh, you know, the strawberry guava, when its leaf litter falls on the ground, it has allelopathic chemicals that are released that prevent the germination of other uh, tree seeds or plant seeds, specifically native ones, and only allows its own seeds to germinate. 
uh, and further spreading out and, and doing the exact same thing uh, of not having any understory. And so, uh, and, and another one, a combination, and over here we have the two combos, right? You have the eucalyptus and you have strawberry guava. The eucalyptus does a similar thing of restricting growth of other species, but it does that through chemicals in its roots. Um, so perfect examples of over here, when you're hiking, you look through and you see this vast canopy of trees, but you look on the ground and you see nothing but roots because all of the surface soil has eroded away because there's nothing holding it in place. Yeah. Top three worst invasives. So hard. <laughs> it, I, honestly, it's, it's, it's hard. If we're talking about Oahu, yeah. Specifically, Oahu, I would say strawberry guava, uh, koa haole, and uh, what else is there? Ah, that third one, man, there's like a <laughs> hundred that just fall into that third place category for me. Yeah. Um, but then there's, to me, the, the third place should be the threat of what's not really established mm. yet. You know, so, oh, I know, easy. Uh, Trema, the gunpowder tree, bruh, the worst. It's going to be like Albizias are bad. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, it's my, you know, feeble opinion that the gunpowder tree is going to be gnarly to, to, you know, you think about 25 years ago, it wasn't even really around anymore. Yeah. Um, now it's like everywhere. We just removed six from our house. So yeah. it's, it's pretty it's, terrible. Yeah. Um, more than just, you know, other invasive plants, our native plants have a number of other threats like, uh, rod, for example. Yes. So when it comes to even the more minute, uh, threats like rod that can play such a large scale, you know, devastation. Yeah. I mean, having things in place to, to minimize that threat and try to do as much as you can, uh, you know, phytosanitation wise, you know, and, and personal, you know, hygiene, <laughs> spread your fungus, man. Yeah. Uh, but, but no, you don't want to, you don't want to go into one place and then be the vector that takes that fungus to another place. Yeah. So humans are, are, they're always the vector, you know, we're pretty good at it. Yeah. So yeah. decontamination when we came on the, yep. the entry to the hike today yep. at the trailhead, there's a decontamination station. Yep. Or even before you come out, you know, do your decon uh, decontamination at home, your decon, do it at home or when you're pow. Uh, so that way it's still fresh on your mind. You get it off and you don't inadvertently take, you know, a little tiny spore of a non-native fern or a little tiny seed of a non-native tree or, a tr you know, like a tremor seed is are really tiny uh, or, you know, fungal pathogens yeah. and viral pathogens. What's the best so, way to decon? Uh, decon at home, you can, you know, sterilize with isopropyl, um, bleach, or throw all your stuff. If you got a big enough freezer, you know, chest freezer, freeze everything, you know, and then, uh, uh, but on your way here, you know, to, before you go up Malka, uh, make sure that your boots are clean, make sure that your clothes is clean. If you, you know, I've gone hiking a couple times and never washed my, my pants, but on top of the pants, it will have, have mud on there, you know, that's dried up. That's the same way that, you know, Kolea brings stuff from other parts of the world when they come over here is, yeah. you know, mud stuck on their feet. So inside that mud, you got all kinds of stuff. So in terms of stewardship, um, yep. it's really important hiking. that we hike on legal trails. Yeah. Why is hike, that? hike on legal trails that are, you know, often managed by, uh, state agencies or government agencies that, you know, ensure that if there is something that's incipient on that trail, that it will be removed. You know, if, if um, a lot of times people will, will take shortcuts on switchbacks and just kind of make a little straight shot in between the curves, don't be a lazy ass, just walk around. That's, that's what the trail is there for already. Um, and whenever you have, you know, if you see something off the trail that you really want to go and get a closer look at, that's why God invented binoculars. <laughs> he did. He did yeah, himself. He did. He did. I know. It's, it's somewhere written in like a big book. Yeah. yeah. So underneath it all, we're really talking about stewardship, which is a component of Malama Aina, which is a core yeah. value for Kanaka as a whole. But looking at it downstream, right? Yeah. How is stewardship of our natural resources up here on these trails, how does this translate down to the Malahini, the visitor, or the uninformed Kama'aina downstream, whether they're in Waikiki or at a hotel or at home? How does stewardship impact everyone? You know, I, I, 
we often think of these places to be stewards of, right? Yeah. Where we have native plants already in place. And unfortunately, you know, we got to hike way up here in order to have that feeling of stewardship when really stewardship needs to take place everywhere. Yeah. Uh, and when people come to Hawaii, you know, if they're not made aware of how fragile our ecosystems are and how few of, of species that we have remaining, I think that they would have a better uh, appreciation for when they do go out and see things that, you know, if I didn't know what was native or what wasn't native and I came up here, I would think, man, Hawaii is so lush and all of this vegetation must be native, you know, must be Hawaiian. Yeah. Uh, at which point, you know, you tend to have a, a sense of, um, you know, like a lackadaisical approach to things because things look so abundant. Yeah. Uh, but really, we're not. We're surrounded by invasives and a handful of natives. Um, if they were made aware of that coming here or it was well known already, then maybe they would have a little bit more concern uh, about the places that they visit and, and are a little bit more respectful of what they see. Yeah. yeah. You know, one thing I think visitors are super aware of our lay in yeah. general um a lot of the lay that are sold nowadays we know that those are not native species yeah. so uh, as stewards as you know yeah. managers of these areas yeah you could still find ways to make what is essentially hawaii accessible to everyone whether you're a visitor or kamaina yeah. and in doing so uh we're talking about hosting a lay competition do you want to talk a little bit about that yeah, I, I think uh, your guys' lay competition, if you have, you know, your two categories, I believe, are going to be uh, one, utilizing an invasive species uh, that's, you know, found on one of the trails, and two, uh, making a lay out of cultivated material from your, from your own garden, yeah. and ideally native. And the concept behind that is, you know, one, you're, when it comes to the invasive species, by going out and collecting parts of the plants that you know for example the flowers if you harvest the flower you collect the flower to make a lay that tree no longer has the ability to make seeds uh so you're you're, re, you're reducing the spread of, of seeds of that invasive species by harvesting its flowers to make lay uh vice versa at home you know the encouragement of growing native plants in your home uh, to make lay may seem very minute but really if everybody did that you know and every household had you know, enough native plant material to make lay, uh, we could recreate an entire dry forest ecosystem which no longer exists anymore because our houses are there, yeah. you know? So, so it's, it's a, and the, the lay is just a, uh, a visual example of, of your commitment to Aloha Aina. Awesome. Well, I want to say mahalo, Rick, for taking me on the hike, teaching me some new things. Right and for our visitors at home, stay tuned to the end of the video to find out more about our two lay competition that are coming up. Aloha. Aloha.